Hello, everyone, and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. I am this program's co-host, DeSoto Brown from Bishop Museum Archives in Honolulu. And joining us from Germany is our program's actual host, Martin Despang. And Martin, are you there? Are you on the screen yet? Yeah, there he is. Hi. I am here. And hello, we, Hi, everyone. We, hello, everybody. And we are going to be talking today about Magnum P.I., is that not correct? Yeah. All right. Well, what's no, in the background? Let's, let's, let's have some nice Feierabend, which means is a German word for have a nice uh, evening to party, actually. That's what Germans do every evening with beer and all the goodies, right? All right. And many Germans, like Americans, watch TV. So let's watch some nice crime scene in the evening here. Okay. And so let's get to the first uh, slide here, uh, please. So I did my research at my son's place. This is the Lenny Stark Studios here. And we were doing what we promised to do research because as we pointed out in the show that you are honoring on your shirt today, DeSoto. Yes. The original Hawaii Five O. Yes. I um, basically acquired the whole DVD set from the, and we were going through them, including at the bottom right, Kurt Sandburn, our activist journalist's favorite one, which, uh, as he says, shows the quintessence of mid-century modern Honolulu, including one of favorite buildings here, which we did a show about at the bottom right, the Alamoana building with still the sun retractable louvers on. But then we were zapping through on the way to watch it we were zapping through tv and we caught what you see at the very top and then there is a launched magnum pi so that brings back memories for uh, us old fogies to soda right and let's yes, go it to does. the next slide and you tell us why well here's john here's tom Selleck, and he was the star of magnum pi and he made a huge impression in the 1980s he's a very iconic looking man uh, partly because of his mustache, let's agree to that. But before he was on Magnum, uh, Tom Selleck was a model and he was doing some other acting. And here are two ads that he did, print ads for cigarettes, which interestingly enough, he doesn't smoke. And the ad on the left is for obviously the United States. And then there's the ad on the right for the same brand of cigarettes, but in German, in Germany, where it has a different name. So this is pre-Magnum Tom Selleck, but uh, he still has a very recognizable look. Does he not? Yes, he does. He does. And you told me yesterday we were dry running here that he also was on Playboy magazine. That's right. His very masculine appearance. And that's right. Being attractive for both men and women for that reason. If we go to the next slide here, um, we... We will, what we're gonna talk about today is Magnum, you already said it. And Magnum um, at the top right, again, we're at Hawaii 5.0 with my best buddy, Stefan, who also uh, purchased what we see at the very bottom. This is the first um, season of Magnum, uh, the erste Staffel, as it says in Germany. And so, um, again, I, I, my generation and, and you, we grew up on that, we, we watched that, so this is a deja vu. And there are other relationships because, um, interestingly enough, I, I found out that what I was watching as a kid was censored. And that's sort of funny, right? You wouldn't think, yeah. in, you know, when Germany, when you guys trusted us again, you know, we would self-censor or you would censor us. But what they did is that they cut out what, um, you know, Magnum at large parts was built on is dealing uh, and, and healing the Vietnam history. And they thought this would be too much for the German TV audience. So they cut this out. And only recently when they were re, you know, featuring them on other TV channels, they were going back and, and synchronizing the whole thing. And Vietnam gets us to a tropical David Rockwood at the, at the top left, whose favorite research place, his other paradise, is Vietnam. And particularly the the, the Nang, and when you watch uh, the the Magnum, the or, the original ones, you see them wearing caps with the Nang saying, "This is where, you know, the, they're scripted to having been stationed." And in the uh, because this is a school, uh, sorry, a show of architecture after all, uh, there is a Saigon bar in the Robin Masters mansion, which is the main building where they reside, which we will get to later. So. Yes. Let's move to the next page here. 
<laughs> um, and you tell us a little bit about because I see a person I is familiar to me at the yes. top right, and so yes. you tell us what this is all about. Well, part of the Magnum uh, mystique and charisma was not only his mustache, but he also wore a series of Aloha shirts. And his Aloha shirts not only placed him as being in Hawaii, but they really identified him as this particular star of this show. So a number of the shirts that he wore were very popular sales for, for sales during that time period while Magnum was on. And in the top right corner, you see this youthful young man with uh, glasses on and a beard and uh, long hair. He, in fact, has a kind of a mullet hairstyle. Well, that's me dressed in a similar kind of shirt to what Magnum was wearing in the 1980s. So there's Thomas Magnum in the 1980s, and there's DeSoto Brown in the 1980s, both wearing the same kind of shirt. That's right. But since yes. we like to talk about not just surface, but substance, I think it's important to talk about the character that he was portraying. Yes. And since you wear your Wi-Fi O shirt, um, if we compare him to McGarrett, um, uh, the main character, the detective in, in Hawaii Five O, and that was purely, you know, um, 60s, late 60s and 70s. And these were the upcoming, the heydays, the boom days of America, shooting people to the moon, refrigerators, microwave, we can do it. Everyone looked up to America. Uh, and that somehow got, got a crack in the, in the early 80s. And that's pretty much or through the 80s, and we're going to get to that later. And this is what Magnum is portraying. He isn't anymore that sort of authoritarian guy, right? That, yes. as you said, never smiles, is always grumpy. I mean, my son's got a kick out of that because he looks so pissed all the time. Yeah. Uh, here, not so much. You see him, you know, Magnum is always smiling, but Magnum is also admitting that he has cracks, you know, yes. because he has, you know, traumas from the war, from the Vietnam War. And that's sort of the, the the mission of the series is to deal with that and make, you know, make that sort of problem, societal problem accessible in an entertaining way, if we can right. say so, right? Right, exactly. And, and so up until the then, slide. yeah, I was just going to say up until then, a lot of times Vietnam veterans were portrayed as very troubled or even criminals. And Magnum is not he has he has uh, thoughts about Vietnam, but he's not a criminal. And he's not super troubled as many of the previous characters had been. Absolutely, yeah. Let's go to the next page here. Uh, so here here he is, and uh, you know, unlike you know, while you know, McGarrett uh, is always grumpy, but uh, architecture plays a major role in the original Hawaii Five O. That's what we were talking about in that show, and a lot of times. Not so much in Magnum, and not surprised because the 80s were sort of troubled times. Um, there was unemployment, uh, economically struggling. So architecture, I had to, in the late 80s, actually, when, when Magnum was, was, was launched um, uh, in, in 1980 in December, um, you know, times weren't quite as funny anymore. And architecture wasn't. I'm, I'm kind of talking trauma. I'm kind of traumatized by the peak of postmodernism, which I don't consider the best era in architecture. So there isn't actually much contemporary architecture. Here we have, again, one of our favorite buildings, the Alamoana building with the louver sill on at that time, because stupid people only took them off a little, well, pretty soon later in the early 90s, I think they did. So architecture. Uh, next picture, um, uh, sometimes when uh, uh, opportunities presented, they were, you know, scripting stories around some events that happened anyways as this one. And you were an eyewitness of that one. Where and when was that, DeSoto? <laughs> yes, I was an eyewitness. This is the Kaiser Hospital, which used to be located on Ala Moana Boulevard near the Ilikai Hotel. It was built in 1958. And then in the 1980s, it got blown up for the construction of the Hawaii Prince Hotel. So, yes. I got to watch it from across the street, and it got incorporated into a Magnum PI episode. And talking eyewitnesses gets us to the next page here, where um, oh, yeah. at the top, this is my little unconventional way of teaching here. But uh, if if you are a Magnum or Tom Selleck maniac, you know you can go online and find funny blogs, and one is there where it says the ten things you don't you might not know about Magnum. And we're going to add to that list with number 11. And what is that about? Well, a lot of people do not know that in the parking lot of the Outrigger Canoe Club, which is what you see in the top picture and in the bottom picture as well, Tom Selleck was attempting to teach his stepson how to drive. 
and the stepson accidentally stepped on the gas, drove the Jeep forward, broke through the cables at the edge of the parking lot uh, floor, and the Jeep plunged some distance. It did not hit the ground. It stopped before it hit the ground. So nobody was injured, but it was a very close call for Tom Selleck as uh, and had it happened, Magnum would have been gone off the air probably without its main star. So it wasn't quite as bad as, I mean, the fall wasn't quite as bad. We pointed out in our last show about the Waikiki Circle Hotel. It's sort of sibling the um, Marina City in Chicago, which became famous in the talking movies in the Blues Brothers, where the car falls off because they have the same innovative but kind of funny uh, guardrail consisting of cables. You know, yeah. and usually you do other things; they're more solid. So let's go to the next picture. Uh, privately investigating here. This is our tropical tourism expert Suzanne uh, doing her research in a post-fossil way on her bicycle, and why would we this is just a few feet down the road on um, here on the extension of Kawa, uh, Kawa Avenue, and we see something that you know is as closely associated with the original uh, Magnum PI um, as Tom Selleck, and it is his car. It's, it's a Ferrari 308, and uh, we were wondering. We didn't quite know that that they had actually started to reboot the show and 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 do a magnum pi again the one that again they're even translating now and and on april 17th as we saw at the beginning of the show um, also broadcasting in germany so here they were filming on the beach which we witnessed here at the, as you can see on the top right here let's go to the next uh, slide here next page um, I also be I also because I'm this is my hood it's in my front yard uh, there is the annual um, sunset on the beach season premiere on Waikiki Beach um, on on Queens Beach which is which is my beach and I always go and then um, here they were showing that the the first episode ever of of the reboot and of course I guess. I guess you can say, of course, it's not Tom Selleck anymore. It's a gentleman, an actor called Jay uh, Hernandez, who plays Magnum. And um, in the first series, uh, they heroically trash the Ferrari uh, 308 and replace it with uh, my consultant, Semi, taught me it's a 488 Spider. So everything is renewed. And again, we started to look, you know, what a rock. Well, is architecture playing, and of course, not as predominantly. Well, I should say, of course, surprisingly, I want to say, uh, they stay true to the original uh, Magnum, where architecture doesn't play such a predominant role, which makes you wondering, you know, maybe there is architecture isn't as iconic anymore these days to make it a, a main actor. And let's go to the next page because, in tribute to your shirt today. Uh, they also had the, the Hawaii Five O uh, newest episode of that season here, and we were happy and almost thought maybe someone is actually listening to us because here they were uh, playing that episode in the Kahala Hilton, which is a Killingsworth building and one of the most innovative buildings we have, um, and we did a show about, but also one of the most threatened because the lease is running out. Kamehameha schools it might be torn down soon, so hopefully this helps to keep sort of the Docomomo-wise public awareness for that building. Uh, next slide, please. And and again, um, this is another iconic piece of architecture that I had the privilege to live in, Waikiki Grand. We did a show about in tropical tourism. Expert Suzanne is uh, looking over the guardrail to see what's going on, and they're filming down there. Uh, they have a set and they have, you know, the TC van there. So it's it's very apparent now in every day's life. And, and you grew up with that, DeSoto, both with Hawaii Five O and then Magnum to constantly see roads being blocked and, and, and sets being set up, right? Yes, absolutely. So next page. <laughs> So what is that? Going back well, to architecture and the new one, we were surprised about that in, in one of the previous shows, right? Yeah, and this is, this, we had a little discussion about this because this is supposed to be the house where the new Thomas Magnum lives. And when you first showed me that, I said, wait a minute, that's not a real house. That's, that's effects, that's special effects. And you can see in the photograph on the bottom at Kualoa Ranch, that's the real setting, but the entire house is actually fake. And it's just created for the TV yeah. series, and you'll never see it in real life because it doesn't exist. 
So that makes you wonder, isn't there any good, you know, contemporary piece of architecture that you could use as an actor, as an architectural actor? And next slide here, uh, we want to see how that was way back. And, and this is um, where they basically staged the, the old Magnum PI house, or we should say the um, Robin uh, Masters house, because it's actually, it wasn't his house. He was living on this property uh, uh, and was working or allowed to stay, we should say, because that's interesting. Again, he, he was really portraying the zeitgeist of the times where many people were struggling because of post-trauma stress disorder and or you know economical reasons and 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 the series was was honest about it you know and, and not sort of trying to create a fake sort of picture that was just about you know fun and crime and and, and these things it was really sort of a, a, a criticism or or at least a, a a reflection of of contemporary society and what was going on there so um this is this is in Waimanalo. And again, my friend Stefan and his wife Kirsten, when they visited, they had the little airplane uh, charter cruise and uh, the pilot and, and basically host and guide was pointing out as a tourist attraction, look down there, this is where Magnum lived. So uh, there were some interesting news recently, next slide, um, about um, what what happened, but but again, let's go back to architecture. We did a show here, which we quote here: "Presidential paradise, um, paradisal presidents." Where we're going through the presidents and their architectural relationships and where they lived. And while the '80s were the turning point from, I say, innovative to reactionary, Carter passing on on to Ronald Reagan, while his uh, his politics his political style was truly reactionary with all respect. Actually, his architectural style was not because he was living in a rather modern ranch house, which was also then used to brand um, the consumption of energy and not the conservation, which we are mainly worried about today. And so th that is sort of interesting. But uh, next slide, um, the, uh, the actual house they used for uh, the original Magnum was they choose I guess intentionally not a contemporary house, but this one. And tell us a little bit when that was built. This house was built about either 1928 or about 1930, and it was a private home. Obviously, a very sumptuous and elegant private home, very costly private home in what was then a very rural area. It continued to be owned by a descendant of the people who built it during this time period, and she allowed not only Five O to film there, but Magno to film there in order to earn money to keep the house going and to keep maintenance going of the house. And she told me that herself <laughs> back in the 1990s. So I knew that was why she was All doing right. it. And we characterize it as so probably a Mediterranean style. Right. style right? Right. I just came back from my uh, oldest son, Joey, and his uh, entrepreneur shaved ice business on Malta. So that reminds me a little bit of that sort of climate zone and cultural concept. So this is sort of an, an imported style, yet works pretty well. It's got lanai's and all the goodies that we need to have yes. our preferred easy breezy uh, lifestyle. Let's go to the next page because then something sort of, uh, well, first of all, here is the interior of the house and it speaks for itself. It's the 80s, you know, it's sort of this sort of cheesy, beigey leather, you know, cushion, all pretty plushy and probably not, again, what America wants to be remembered for for its best, right? This was sort of a downtime, one can say. And when he wasn't wearing, you know, Aloha shirts, he was wearing the typical sort of baggy clothes, it, you know, funny times, but again, it's all relative and there's probably some retro about that and every style and every time comes back. But the 80s interior and, and, and you know, actually um, clothing, not so much for some obvious reasons. As, no, just give it time, you know, it'll the come back. Architecture, postmodernism isn't, well, uh, hopefully with architecture, it's not the case because I don't want to see uh, postmodernism again, but that's my personal trauma again. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's go to the next page because something uh, surprisingly happened here, talking news. And what was that? Because there were these articles here in the, in the newspapers all over the place. Well, the house was sold. The house was put on the market. The house was sold. And it was bought by, or the property was purchased by a not by Barack Obama, but by a friend of Barack Obama. So there continue to be rumors that the friend actually purchased it for him. Uh, the original house has now been demolished. And so some kind of new home would be, is going to be built. 
perhaps for Barack and Michelle Obama, but that's not confirmed. And you've actually talked to some people with some inside information, correct? Yeah, and you know, you also being closely related to uh, you know our you know historic Hawaii and our tropical tutor Bill Chapman as well. You got to wonder tearing down something from the '30s, but you know maybe it wasn't that significant or whatever it was. But also, it was a tourist attract attraction, and that that got eliminated. So you got to wonder it better be replaced by something better, as we always say. And there's right. there is some hope, which you're referring to. Next page here. Because within the architectural community, there are some leaks here. And so here, this is supposedly the architects who are going to design something for the former president. And they are rather innovative. And, uh, you know, the architectural, you know, language is rather modern. And hopefully also the house is going to be as modest in size and not a McMansion. And that right. was what we would expect from Obama as innovative as he has been in contrast to the current president and his uh, property in Florida, the other tropics, which is the opposite. So let's yes. go to the next page here because we want to sort of sooner or later uh, pretty much phase out uh, and, and sort of conclude. Here we see, uh, again, uh, we, we, we see acknowledged that Magnum uh, is sort of an icon, is a cultural icon. Uh, he got inducted into the Smithsonian Institute. Well, actually, his shirt here, which is which he's dedicating to that, and he's also next page apparent, you know, in uh, pretty much pop culture. Next slide, please. Uh, through the shirts are still there or here again, and kids can play with the original Magnum with his Ferrari and TC's bus and the helicopter. Uh, TC's helicopter, and the helicopter gets us to a, a different spin of the story here, our private investigated story. Next slide, please. Because uh, this here is where, um, you know, our uh, investigative vehicle, literally and figuratively, is, is my old Mercedes here, which pretty much this model here, uh, they discontinued uh, around the time when Magnum was discontinued in the late 80s, in, in 1988, actually. So this is kindly staying here out at Barbara's Point with another JJ Mormon and Brad Segikawa at the bottom, who run a little, um, you know, historic, uh, um, you know, military vehicle uh, museum out there at, at Barbara's Point. And so um, next slide, because um, Brad is um, is the longest, you know, standing and, and still semi-active, if you ask him kindly, model maker on the island here, architectural model maker. And so um, he told uh, us that the hangar next door, which we see here, which I was overly excited um, to be an Albert Kahn building. Albert Kahn is a very famous industrial architect from back in the days, which you see at the top left. He did some buildings, especially the one, uh, the third to the left uh, here um, in that area, which is very iconic building, very Bauhausian. But the hangar, unlike the ones that you see at the top right, which are on the island of Midway, which are by Kahn, are Ours isn't uh, by by Khan, but the Magnum PI studios are in there. And next page, um, uh, Brad has to go over there in his capacity of model making because um, Higgins, who is the Robin Masters, basically, um, you know, person who's running the the, uh, the 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 land there, isn't that grumpy older British guy anymore, but a very attractive uh, young woman here. And she scripted to, in her free time, uh, making little ship models. And so Brad is helping out. And this is why he has an inner scoop, literally and figuratively speaking, of the hangar. And he tells us that just behind that blue door is actually where they built the interior of the new Magnum PI that from the outside, as you analyze, is fictional. But on the inside is real, at least as a set. And in a previous show, we kind of tried to characterize it. And we called it sort of coral kitsch. You know, it is easy breezy, it is open, but again, it sort of looks like the sort of the the ordinary average, more upscale house. That's what people would do in Hawaii, sort of lick and stick, you know, surface yeah. veneer and, and yeah. things like that. Anyways, let's go to the next uh, slide here, um, which um, is... Um, Pretty much, this is a shot from the, not that long ago, like in the 
beginning of our century here. And and it's interesting because um, Magnum didn't even leave in that uh, live in that big house, but he lived in what they call a guest house. It was a little shack uh, or a little cabana. And uh, next slide on the inside, it looked like this. And it's probably a good, it's scripted in a way that it's a representation of, again, Magnum being not the ideal, I mean, he's a different hero. He's a true hero, we say, right? And yeah. and, and his, his place looks pretty unorganized and trashy as, and all over the place as as he was, and it looks cheap. And, that, and that's what, you know, he represents the sort of the more lower part of, of Americans at that time that, that struggle and try to make a living, right? Yeah. Next page. Here and and they, I found this artist here, uh, artist series who make little frames of, of of floor plans, and they made one of this guest house here. And with that, maybe you know, Magnum was a trendsetter for something that's very prevalent now and very zeitgeisty, which is struggling for um, dwelling space. And we made a show with Rich Richardson up there, who's a tiny house pioneer on the island. So that might be an issue and obviously is, as we point out in many shows and in this one here as well. So the next page shows us a, um, <laughs> and, and, you know, we, we found, this is funny. Why, why is this funny to Soto? Well, this is funny because as you pointed out, both Hawaii Five-O and Magnum PEI rely on the concept that Honolulu and Oahu and Hawaii are very crime ridden. And they, all these guys have to solve all these crimes. And in fact, this guide or this uh, chart shows that the 10 safest metropolitan cities in 2018 in the United States includes Honolulu as one of the safest ones. So in fact, we're not crime ridden, despite what these TV shows portray. Yeah, but nevertheless, we have some very sort of explosive potential and that gets us to the next slide. And you gave me this article, so please, what is that about? Well, we also did a, we did a show about the Makaha Valley Inn and the golf course there and what has happened in the course of the development and then the loss of much of that, uh, what had been built in Makaha. But just recently it was announced that Tiger Woods is uh, going to be designing a new golf course there as they start to try to get this whole resort area going again, which we were talking about, can, can there be accommodations for people to be given homes there who currently are homeless, particularly in the Waianae area? And what we see here is, no, we're gonna be going back to a high-end resort instead of housing people like that, most likely. Exactly. And that gets us back to Waimanalo next page, where we have similar issues, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. this is the military is there, but also there's housing intense along Kamehameha Highway. And this is where the homeless go because they have no other place to. So next page, we're sort of polemically proposing suggestions that gets us back to Barbara's point on Jay and um, Brad's property here and talking movies they're currently shooting another movie which is called Godzilla versus Kong and Pasha uh, containers have donated these containers and they basically painted them in this combat green to shoot that and we were exactly a year ago almost uh, with a with a studio that was looking to make the most space with the least means and we're looking once again into cargo yeah. uh, containers as a large module building material and the spacing of these containers here was exactly what we were um, imagining which gets us to the next page and this is this is the review of the project that you unfortunately weren't able to be there, but most everyone else is there that we know from previous shows or from collegial shows is Howard Wig here, Code Green, Showmaster, and we want to uh, um, extend special greetings and and uh, wishes for recovery to Richard Lowe, who's in the middle, who was one of our favorite guests from the past and will be in June. He had a little uh, accident and is currently recovering from that. So all the best to you, uh, Richard. We see Brad here again in his capacity of a model maker showing the emerging generation how to build architectural and also landscape models. And the uh, next page, two next pages, is going to 
show the project and i'll let you explain it because you're as much of an expert in it as i as we are so what is that well what so, we're looking at is the potential reuse of shipping containers and this is a an area that's being explored a great deal now and by stacking or arranging the containers equal distance apart you allow an empty space a negative space between each one of the containers giving people who live in them a little empty open space for outdoor living here in the hawaiian islands which is what we certainly should be doing. And I think we can go to the next picture. And uh, there is the way it could be worked out. Uh, and as you pointed out, heavily vegetated so that in these empty spaces, you can put a lot of uh, vegetation in to create shade, create coolness, keep moisture, et cetera. So the reuse of containers is something that really can be looked into, particularly for low income housing. And that's a direction that we probably should be going. Yeah, and obviously we're we're at the end of the show. We're uh, encouraging the the movie industry to go back to its roots and innovate its tradition of addressing sociotel, you know, opportunities. Yeah. As in case of the original Hawaii Five O, uh, booming and good architecture being an actor or Magnum PI addressing issues and problems and probably solving them. So yeah, both things right. together, please, movie industry, help us out to portray a real picture. Um, of our islands, which might not always be as pretty, you know, right. as people right. think, but right. but it's honest and it helps to keep the island alive. And, yeah. and as we, you did many presentations about the the evolution of tradition on the islands, right? Right. So this seems exciting. So stay with that and maybe get us back in front of the camera on air next week uh, with Correct. a show comparing uh, my place currently here because that's an opportunity while me being here to do this sort of intercultural correspondence, obviously. So let's compare Munich and Honolulu once again in, in the same context. And I think we have a great working title. What was that? Yes, again? it is. It, breaker? it is going to be uh, crime, primetime crime shows. And so we're going to be comparing Magnum PI and uh, one of the crime shows is shot in Germany. Exactly. And the, the main actors, uh, the detective team will be bundled, Kanistakon and Janice Lee, and, and your work is to reach out to them and get That's together right. with them this That's week. Right. So we're going to report about that next week that I'm That's very right. much looking forward to. Okay, we're at the end of the all show. Right. So thank you all for being here, everybody. See you again next time on Human Humane, Ar Human Humane Architecture on ThinkTech Hawaii. Thank you. Aloha.